Yes, thank you very much. So this part of the program was uh, dedicated to have some uh, surgical technical points. I thank Professor Punk for a very instructive lecture on the monitoring of the brain stem, very important for every posterior fossa tumor. Now we change topic, another technical issue, which is uh, really important in children because it's changed a lot in terms of surgery, as I told you before, uh, of uh, the cellar and the supracellar region, the endoscopic transphenoidal uh, approach. When we talk about endoscopic transphenoidal approach in children, especially in children, we should remember some anatomy of the sphenoid sinus. We are uh, crossing the sphenoid sinus. We should know and remember, this is especially for the young people, again, I would say, that sphenoid sinus uh, is a variable anatomic structure, and uh, especially three types are the most frequent ones that we experience of sphenoid sinus. It can be like this, like the first one, like hey, here, so even not form and what we call the concal type, or it can be uh, just in front of the cell, what we call uh, the UNL precella uh, type. Or finally, the usual type we are used to, the third one, the type C, which is uh, the so-called cellar type of sphenoidal sinus. And uh, what is actually classically known about the sphenoid sinus is that the pneumatization of the sinus starts uh, at 3-4 years and stops at 14 years and is agenetic in 1% of the cases. But there are some more modern insights about it. As we know from MRI studies, 9-10 uh, years old children may have a completely pneumatized sinus already and the sinus can be seen, he identified already at two months of age on axial MRI or four months of age on sagittal MRI structure. Once we have known this, and you will see how important it is for children, uh, the second real important point is to state which are the advantages and limits of transphenoidal surgery in pediatric patients. Certainly similar to what we see in adults, it's a minimal invasive approach with a wide surgical vision and a reduced morbidity compared with the open approach because of, of the absence of brain retraction and the low risk for nasal and sinusal complication, not damage to the teeth as it happens with the microsurgical endoscopic approach and a low risk of alteration of the craniofacial growth. Not last, the short hospital stays in the quick recovery of this kind of patients. There are limits, obviously, that should be particularly considered in children. The first one, obviously, are the dimensions of nostrils and nasal fossa. We have told about the pneumatization of sinus and the, the lack still now of a, a very good dedicated instrumentation. For end surgery, I would say, that most of us, most of the people interested in transphenoidal surgery, and particularly in pediatric uh, transphenoidal endoscopy surgery, prefer, and they also prefer the forehand surgery, which means two surgeons. The, uh, this kind of uh, technique has been firstly proposed in the 1990s, improving the surgical time and uh, being used also for expanded approaches. It means good visions while working area with the possibility to have synchronous movements of the scope and other instrumentation. You will see some examples, some video. The combination of more than one surgery working in the same environment with an active role of the assistant. So I think still it's a, an enhancing way of our procedure effectiveness. It has been also demonstrated in the literature many times. Let's see some technical uh, point, general point uh, for the young people to remember the position of the patients and the operating room set up as usually like this with the head of the patients rotated through uh, the two surgeons. The two surgeons were working one near the other and the nurse in front of it just lateral while well, directly in front of the surgeon is the screen of the endoscope. Uh, we need a dedicated rigid endoscope uh, with this kind of uh, micro instruments and I will say especially in some quite a few cases of uh, uh, pediatric cell and supracellar region, neuronavigation might really help a lot. 
the approach, both in ENT and neurosurgeon. Also, it's important to involve our ENT colleagues in our surgery. Nasal cavity up to uh, the posterior part of the septum is something that they know very well and they do every day. So it r renders the procedure much faster than if we do it alone, even with some experience more. So I always involve our ENT surgeons and uh, we will see uh, the different steps of the procedure starting properly from the approach to the nasal cavity, which is done by uh, the ENT surgeon. So the approach to the nasal nostrils and uh, the vision of the middle turbinate, which is actual under our aspirator, the removal, we are here from the, uh, the left side of the middle turbinate from the left sides is important. The coagulation of this uh, small arteries, sethmoidum axillary uh, arteries, which are often in the fields, and uh, the removal of the septum, which starts from the coagulation um, of the uh, nasal uh, mucosa around the, uh, the septum, and the, the preparation, you see, with the knife of the nasal flap. This is also another important part of the procedure that we have to take in mind, especially for the reconstruction of the cellular floor. This is very important. Detachment of the mucosa from the posterior part of the septum uh, as a first step. This is before, after having detached it, we remove. Uh, we trying to preserve as much as possible. So you see that uh, slowly we just detach the posterior part of the septum. That is used uh, for the reconstruction whenever possible. It's very important for the closure, especially in patients which we have to open the subarachnoid spaces. This is then we transfer from the right side and we just luxate here the middle turbinate. In most cases, you don't need to remove both middle turbinates. One is enough. And you see the ostium to the sinus sphenoidale just after the luxation. You see the approach and the approach arrives just inside the sphenoidal sinus. So this is the first part of the procedure, which looks quite common uh, to what we see in uh, adults. But again, remember what I told you in some patients like this one, you see there is no sphenoidal sinus. This is a, a clearly a concal type of sphenoidal sinus. So in these cases, I would always suggest uh, to use neuro navigation. This is very important. Otherwise, you completely lose your direction to the cell and you may find to be just in the uh, frontal, anterior frontal fossa, anterior fossa. So you see how it works. Both the, the endoscope vision and the CT, even the CT scan is enough for this to get to the uh, bone structures and arrive directly without any uh, sinus, because we don't have any sinus to the cellular uh, floor. We control our direction. Uh, uh, step by step through the nostril. And you see how the, the navigation leads us directly to uh, the cellular floor. This is our experience in the light, last 80 years or so for these children, mostly part of them are adenomas in cranial for insomas. Actually, I will show some example of the uh, second part of the endoscopic transphenoidal uh, procedure to show you the differences among the different pathologies. This is uh, the first case, a 14 years old girl. Uh, with the classical symptoms of uh, uh, increase the PRL hormone, so this is a prolactinoma. Uh, this is at the time of surgery. We are entered the sphenoid sinus, so now we are inside the sphenoid sinus, and this is the cellular floor. It's very frequently, as in adults, also in children, the cellular floor is thinned by the pushing down of the tumor on the cellular floor itself. So you see, it's very easy to remove, and then you see uh, you, see, you see the opening of the dura with a knife. And after the opening of the dura, this is the most uh, clear aspect that we, we see for uh, this kind of tumor. The tumor is pushed out uh, directly from the increased uh, intracellular pressure. So I, uh, you can easily remove, in this case, is the first part because it comes into your surgical face directly pushed by the pressure. And uh, the difference with many cases that in some examples you will also see afterwards of current pharyngioma is that obviously in the case of adenomas, you have this kind of tumor is strictly attached to the uh, hypothesis. So you have to grasp it uh, so very smoothly with this uh, curate under uh, the dura to get the removal. 
and uh, again the, the detaching of the tumor from the normal uh, hypophyseal gland with the curette. I see some difference. You see this other case uh, is a, a case of an 11 years old guy with this lesion who turned out to be a craniopharyngioma. Apparently on the MRI scan it can appear uh, quite cystic uh, kind of lesions but uh, with uh, some uh, inhomogeneous uh, uh, signal inside. So we really uh, do, cannot predict in all cases uh, what we uh, will find. So this uh, turned out to be a quite easy case. The most easy case is when uh, the internal part of the craniopharyngioma, as in this case, uh, is composed mostly by the classic machine oil uh, fluid. You see that after, just after the opening of the cellar floor, uh, the, the turning out of all the, this fluid it renders the surgery very easy just an aspiration on the border of the dural opening uh, actually does 90% uh, uh, of the surgical procedures in a, a few minutes. This is uh, uh, all the time that it requires. So this is really what we would like to have in, uh, in all cases, but it's not the case actually, as you will see. And even the small uh, nodule, that is this uh, yellow, uh, small uh, rounded structure that you see in the fields at the end of the aspiration comes so near to the dural opening that even uh, you don't need to strictly enter uh, the cell to see at the end of the tumor removal how much uh, is gone from the uh, surrounding uh, structure because it easily comes. But this is, uh, I would say, quite an uh, exception. Uh, an easy, we would like it in, uh, all the times, but it does not come always, only occasionally. This is another example. You see in this case, again, uh, it appears to be mostly cystic tumors, cellar tumor, quite easy. This is a recurrence. So in every recurrence, it's different anyway. You should expect something like this. So at time of the opening of the uh, dura, again, and the approach inside the cella, this uh, cross opening that uh, we use and is common to the other kind of procedures in adults. This, there is no, absolutely no cyst. It's a solid tumor, also with fibrotic kind of tissue, which comes most probably from the previous surgery. So it comes to be a very different kind of surgery and should be uh, much more careful to detach both with the forceps and the aspirators together uh, from the surrounding structure to get to, you see, to the opening of the arachnoid with some CSF uh, fluid come in, coming in before uh, going also much more inside the cell to detach the rest of the parenchymal part. You see how much solid was this kind of tumor unexpectedly compared with what we could see on the MRI. So especially recurrence, uh, even if you see any cyst there, most of the cases it's not a cyst. It's a solid tumors with fibrotic tissue inside. Another example of uh, this, uh, what it looks this uh, like cellar and supracellar uh, craniopharyngioma in an 11 years uh, old uh, boy with this kind of uh, general hormonal assets before surgery but also visual deficits, which are common for supracellar region. But this midline quite, uh, uh, looks uh, quite expanding uh, symmetrically above the cell atorchica. So this is, again, a very good indication for endoscopic transplenoidal surgery. Uh, but this is a different example. It looks like a craniopharyngioma, but already when you open uh, the dura, again, similar technique with the cross, and you see this sluggish, sluggish kind of uh, fluid uh, appearance inside. Most probably this is not a craniopharyngioma. This is the most typical aspect, the sluggish fluid of the Ratke cleft leaves, cysts. So even if rare, the Ratke cleft cysts are usually much easier to remove from the endoscopic view than a pure uh, craniopharyngioma. They have a very small capsule, uh, which usually is well detached from um, the hypothalamus, and uh, they have no calcification. That's the most uh, important uh, thing in, I would say, in all cases I've seen there is no calcification. You see at the end of the removal, the arachnoid just above the cell. So different assets. And then it comes the, what I would say might be the most difficult cases, the craniopharyngiomas, cellular and supracellular, but with mm, attachment to the hypothalamus and multi, apparently multi-cystic appearance. More uh, clearly, more exactly to say 
inomogeneous appearance. Uh, CT scan, especially in this case, is mandatory if you want to do a transphenoidal surgery endoscopically uh, because you need to know where calcifications are to see how much difficult will be your procedures. In this case, I would say uh, the only calcification we see is uh, in the uh, anterior part. So uh, I think it can be done even with this in inhomogeneous appearance through the endoscopic transphenoidal uh, root. And you see at the time of surgery, we are already inside the cell. Uh, this is much more calcification than we expected on the floor of the tumor. And uh, again, both forceps and aspirator to, asp to dissect the tumor from the surrounding structure, uh, both forceps and aspirators just to detach uh, the tumor from the surrounding site. There was a catheter that was put in another site for hydrocephalus, and you see uh, after the removal of the tumor, we are inside the third ventricle, so we have uh, clearly uh, documented we uh, had remove the tumor completely, the two foramina of Monroe at the end of the procedures to the third ventricle. So in this case, yes, we could expect some more uh, difficulty, but with, due to the reduced kind of calcification, you can afford uh, um, without an higher risk this kind of procedures in children. And so it is advised to do it endoscopically, transphenoidally. There are uh, in children of not uh, infrequently strange kind of pathologies. This was just one of the ones that uh, uh, happened to us. This is not really what I would say a cellular tumor already on the MRI and you see that CT scan confirmed but uh, still it is on the way of a transfer endoscopic transphenoidal route and it comes also if it comes intracranially uh, you can afford it with the help of uh, neural navigation and I would say it's also in this kind of cases, bone uh, tumors coming from the cellular, paracellular flow are a very good in indication also in children, even with a reduced space. You see the appearance of the tumor is much different. Fibrotic tissue attached, invading, invading uh, the bone, uh, looks like probably what you would expect in an adult meningioma. Obviously, it was not. And, uh, uh, this comes, came out to be a, a sarcoma in this uh, kind of children. see, both with the help of endoscopic transphenoidal surgery, subtotal removal, and proton beam after 2.5 years of surgery, the tumor has not recurred. The other important part, very important part of the surgery is the reconstruction of the cellular flow. So we have ended our surgery and we need to close, uh, especially in craniopharyngiomas where the we have CSF loss is very important. We uh, try not to leave anything inside the cell. The first thing we, le we leave is the posterior part of the septum inside on the borders of the cell. When we have a nasal flap, we uh, can use it. Otherwise, it may happen, especially in small children, we uh, use uh, some uh, fat tissue uh, uh, and uh, also some fibrin glue around, uh, some around the mucosa with the uh, covering of it, and then some some, uh, some spongos then to close, to fin finalize our closure. So multi-layered closure of the cell is uh, very important in these patients. Now let's see, is does uh, really uh, endoscopy as an advantage also compared with this other current or techniques? We have for many years have used the, the microsurgical sublabial route also in children. These are the two groups. The first group is dedicated to microlab, uh, microsurgery sublabial uh, resections, and the second group, group B, is the, the one of uh, endoscopic transphenoidal surgery for different uh, pathologies that I have showed you. And certainly, the change to the endoscopic transphenoidal has uh, improved uh, the number of days of stay in the intensive care unit. The mean hospital stay is confirmed uh, lower. It can be even significantly lower as uh, in this comparison that we did among these uh, two kind of patients. Um, uh, at least mm, lower is also the incidence uh, of uh, uh, hormonal deficit of surgery compared with the uh, uh, general microsurgical uh, approach. But the two most significant things, again, uh, were uh, the entity of uh, blood transfusion that was significantly lower. The time of surgery was significantly lower. 
as well the post-operative stage as I told you. So we, uh, from these comparisons, uh, we concluded uh, this uh, study that we uh, published it, and I want to just uh, uh, confirm what I said during this presentation. Uh, it is significantly more comfortable with post-operative course in this kind of children. We don't have labial incision, we don't have mucosal trauma, and mostly we can reduce the number of late complications related to the approach and uh, uh, related also to the damage to the hypothalamic pituitary axis. There is a, a drawback, a limit of this consideration. Obviously, if you look at the literature up to the end of, of the last year, you see what is the difference among uh, what happens in adults and children. Only 42 real cases uh, of endoscopic endonasa transferenoidal surgery published for uh, the cellular supracellular uh, lesions, in which are mostly cranial pharyngiomas. And so there is a more tricky acquisition of expertise and uh, certainly to meet the need for referral centers. Thank you very much.